We uh, welcome everybody to today's webinar. It's called Convening, Coordinating, and Collaborating for Socio-Ecological Transitions, the Case of Zen Communities. My name is Jorge Garza. I'm Manager of Cities and Climate Transitions at the uh, Tamarack Institute. And our, I would like to point out that this webinar is developed in collaboration with the Front Commun. So before I begin, I would like to point out that we are meeting today on Indigenous territory, which has never been ceded. It is with respect for the connections to the past, present, and future that we acknowledge the ongoing relationship with Indigenous peoples, their contribu contributions, and their historical significance in order to affirm our collective commitment to the promise and challenge of truth and reconciliation in our communities. <clears throat> so I'm calling from Tuatake, the unceded traditional territory of the Kenningkehaka, or Mohawk people, now known as. Now uh, let's introduce our guest panelists. Daryl Dupuis, uh, who's a board member of the Front Commun pour la Transition Energétique, the Common Front for Energy Transition. Anouk Nadeau Farley, coordinator and liaison officer for the Grand Regional Dialogue for the Social Ecological Transition of Lac Saint Jean, and Pierre Luc Barry, project manager, uh, the Laval Hub, and uh, for the Common Front for, uh, for the Energy Transition. So, thank you very much for being here today with us. And of course, there are full biographies available on our event page, and we'll be sharing the. Uh, the links to those uh, biographies as well. So welcome, Carole, Anouk, and, and Pierre-Luc. So I would like to, to share a, uh, a few reflections before we get... So we're, today we're going to be looking at a, a very interesting uh, initiative that's happening in, in Quebec. So the Zen Community uh, Initiative is an example of how we can work with current and future generations to transition to uh, a carbon neutral society. So today we'll be having a discussion in, in two parts. In the first part, we'll start with some preliminary questions for our panelists about the work that they're doing. And in the second part, we'll be talking, we'll be asking more specific questions. And then after our discussion, we'll have time for questions and answers. And so we invite you to put your questions and comments in the chat box. And then we'll end our discussion with uh, a few reminders. So, Carole, our first question is for you. And it has to do with the strategies of the Collectivité Zen. So, in your experience, what strategies distinguish the uh, this the Collectivité Zen project from other transition projects in Quebec? And what is the role of the Front Commun in Zen community? Thank you to the Tamarack Institute for inviting us. And thank you to all of you who are with us today. First of all, I'm going to give you a little bit of contact about the, organ the organization that's behind the Zen uh, communities. And the Front Commun pour la Transition Energétique is a coalition uh, with about 90 members. And they uh, work in, uh, in environment and also in union. So a number of our members are organizations as well and other types of groups. And we represent about 1. million people. So it's a very big organization, it's, and it's very young as well. It's a coalition that, uh, it, that, that's still kind of defining itself. And what unites us is our willingness to help implement the social, social and ecological transition 
Now, Zen is a is an acronym that means zero uh, or zero carbon emissions. And we work in specific areas spread around Quebec, and we want these people to work together to implement uh, hubs. Now, these the territories can be quite small. It could be a neighborhood or even a town, or it can be large territories, a city, uh, or even uh, an administrative region. So it's the, it's the hubs themselves that define uh, what has meaning for them. So we don't impose that. The, these uh, communities uh, have been uh, operating in four uh, locations, and then there are four others that will be joining next fall, and then we hope to add others in the coming years. So let's get, in, get to the heart of the matter. What are the strategies uh, that distinguish Zen communities projects? First of all, les collectivités Zen are focused on social um, conversation. So there, in, in the environmental field, there are two approaches. There's a, uh, there are lobbying groups with public decision makers, and they involve writing of letters, talking to the newspapers, and sometimes there's direct action. So, for example, there were students who occupied a, a place at Justice Montreal last uh, week. So that's kind of the lobbying approach. On the other extreme, there are transition initiatives, and there's a lot of them. Uh, collective gardens, uh, repair cafes, uh, zero emission buildings, and that type of thing. And these approaches are all relevant, and they're all necessary, and they're indispensable for, the tra for a transition. So the Collectivity Zen, and that's why I talked about the common front as well, uh, but we, we, we're exploring a third way, if you will, uh, collaborative and structured uh, activities working towards transition. So it's, a, it's an approach that uh, works with specialists, climate specialists, so the Front Commun, and collective development specialists. specialists. So it's the only example to our knowledge that uh, wants to work with each community in Quebec and which aims at local, um, local ac action. So that's the first, my first part of the answer. Now, les collectivités zen aren't just looking for, you know, a reduction in, uh, in uh, emissions, but they, they're looking at a systemic uh, systemic changes as well, so economical uh, or economic and social. So our the goal of this project is to achieve uh, carbon neutrality throughout the region, and to do it in an organized way, but also in an inclusive way. So social justice, participatory documentary, do, uh, do, democracy are also important elements. And then the third part of my answer is that these uh, Zen, co Zen communities are also, it's not a top-down approach. It's, it's, it's about people ap appropriating the goals and doing work in a distributed manager. So the work of the, front, uh, the common front is not to impose uh, a specific solution. Each community is different. Each community has its own personality. And the front commun, we're, we're convinced that it's only if when everybody works together to co-construct uh, a transition, and that's the only way that it's going to work. So the role of the Front Commun is to support the emergence of these activities and to accompany these, these uh, communities, but especially to be a kind of a, uh, uh, a networker, if you will, for, for communities that want to get involved in this, in this type of activ activity. Thank you, Carole. 
that's a very good summary of the, of the great work that you're doing. Your, 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 um, I, your, I liked what you had to say about each community being uh, unique. And that's why we have Pierre-Luc and Anouk who are here. They'll be talking about their own journey and their own experience. And it's interesting for communities to listen to you today because it's, this is a very f fresh approach. So thank you very much, Carole. We're going to go to our second question now. And this one is for Anouk. I'm going to read something that, that I have here, and then I'm going to be uh, sharing a few slides that you prepared for us today. So the, uh, the Grand Regional Dialogue for the Socio-Ecological Transition of Lac Saint-Jean is, is a movement rooted in a commitment to scaling up the transition towards new political, food, mobility, economical, or economic, cultural, and, and land systems. So could you tell us more about your vision for mobilizing citizens in your community and as well as your plans for the future? Yes. So at, in Saguenay Lac Saint Jean, our slogan uh, that we developed, or that, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm having some technical issues here. All right, there's a lot of screens. Everybody has a lot of screens. Oh, I'm not able to. Sorry, it won't. It won't take long. So the, the, the slogan that we have, that we, that we use to, to launch our movement is on le sait, on a tout, on le fait. So we know we have everything and let's do it. So if we don't do anything, we know that things are going to get worse. We know that there are social inequalities and that that are... Are, are getting worse. We know that the pandemic has, uh, has impacted the social fabric and, mental, and the mental health of, of, of many people. So these are, are the challenges of the 21st century. And so we said, listen, we have everything we need here in the, in the region to deal with those issues uh, and to, uh, to co-construct a, a roadmap for socio-ecological transition in the region. Now there are already a number of initiatives, and uh, that, and a number of initiatives that, that that are worth hearing about. And these, there are many initiatives that should be known better, but we need to work together. And we need to work together to work towards a society that is respectful. And that is uh, environmentally friendly. So what we said was, listen, we have everything we need. We just need to do it. So what we're doing is we put, we're, we put dialogue at the center of our efforts. We listen to everyone. And the objective is to make, or to have the, the, the greatest number of people participate so that we develop a, a common vision for the next 10 years. And so citizen, or citizen participation is very, is at the heart of what we're, we're trying to do. So how do we build a, a common vision to a roadmap? So may, I'll, I'll get you to move. We'll go to the second slide. So after we launched our movement, which was launched in October 2020, we, we, we set up our governance structure, and that's what you see here on the screen. Now, it's a decentralized model. Everybody who wants to contribute to our circles of work or our thematic circles of work uh, can do so. So the circle of circles, the blue circle in the screen, it, what that means is that there's one, 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 one time a month or once a month, people who work in those various circles get together to talk about their needs and to ensure coherent action. 
and, and to make sure that we make progress on our commitments. And then we have our, our work branches. Uh, and so, so you have, there are a few examples here. There's the youth branch. And so these are activities that we do with young people because we want everybody to involve, including young people. So we're going to, we, uh, in schools, there are different uh, after school activities and we, we organize day activities. And we want, we, we ask young people, you know, what their dreams and aspirations are. So we based ourselves on this mobilization strategy, which is based on a Rogers uh, curve. So that's, this is kind of an, an explanation about our, our, our mobilization strategy. So we have the, the innovators, the people who have the ideas, then you have the first adopters, so the, the first people, for example, to buy a new product, uh, those are the, the new adopters. And then the third, uh, the early majority are the people that, um, and then there's an early majority and then a, a later majority that adopt the idea. And then the last group um, is a group that we don't often go over because they're, they're often resistant to joining the movement. So. So if we let's come back to the pre previous slide. So we use the, a forest metaphor, and you can see that at the bottom of the screen, and that it reflects kind of how we operate as well. So at the beginning, we come up with an idea. There's a, there's the germination of an idea, a, a seed that was planted, and then people get involved. So you see the little sprout uh, in blue. So these are people that are following us closely. Maybe there are there are people that are already involved in other activities, but but we're that's really the core of people that get involved, and then the idea spreads and the branches grow. Uh, it grows into various areas and spheres of society. So we go through various organizations to go and meet the diversity of the community. So, and that's represented by the the leaf. So we're, the, the point is to try to get as many people involved as possible so that we can transform the tree into a forest. And that's that's what we... That's what our final aim is. So we have been created discussions in, in, the, in the past year uh, about what people aspire to. What are, what are the dreams that people have or our region? What are our, what are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? Um, so we're, we're listening to the people in our region. Next slide, please. So there are 21 themes that are part of our individual and collective lives, and that will have an impact on uh, the trans transformation in the region. So you see them illustrated here in the, uh, in the calendar. There's uh, health, the, the ability to act, work, uh, recreation, seniors. So in our dialogue activities, our, acti our dialogue activities we ask people questions about these different themes to get them to, to think about what their ideals are for the future. So we have about two or three years of work left uh, at this stage. And as you saw in the, in the mobilization model, we want to hear all the voices. So we're, and we're creating uh, linkages with uh, organizations that are working with people that living, living in poverty, with uh, the sexual diversity groups, people working with industry. We have no choice but to create ties between these people and to get into contact with as many people as possible. So in conclusion, once we have a, a united 
uh, vision, then we'll be able to come up with an action plan and, and a concrete roadmap with clear objectives, timelines. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to decide who, who's responsible for what, and we'll be able to come up with, with uh, specific actions. And to get there, we really depend on the creation of local transition projects, uh, linkages between organizations, and th so there will be a working group that will de determine by sector how we're going to develop uh, objectives to help us meet our goals. All right, thank you, Anouk. What, uh, we, we really like the, uh, the metaphor of the forest. Uh, and, and, and speaking of forests, We want to hear about Pierre Luc's experience with uh, the, the Laval Zen. We want to, and, you know, the work that you're doing there is is incredible. Uh, you're you're trying to reach local stakeholders and citizens, and you're trying to position Laval as a leader. Now, in your context, Pierre Luc. What role can institutions play in the socio-ecological transition? Thank you, and thank you to the Tamarack Institute, Institute for op offering us this opportunity to, uh, to talk about what we're doing. So to answer your question, so in, in, in Laval, we're, we're, we really do a lot of collaboration work with uh, organizations, and they play three significant roles. They provide expertise, they provide influence, and they provide uh, leadership. So those are three areas where institutions uh, play a significant role. In terms of expertise, institutions, the institutions, depending on their area of specialization, have access to data, they have access to, uh, that, are, that are specific to their mandate. So that's and that's really crucial because that allows them to act and to to take action. Uh, so, so a quick example: the CEGEPs, universities, uh, chambers of commerce are places that can have access to specialized resources in in a, in a given area. So that's the first role that institutions have. So they they act as experts and they they can act as witnesses to their experts, expertise. Now, the second role is, is a role of, of influencer. Institutions, are, are nev they never work in isolation, and they're part of a network that's often much broader. So that means that, that they have a, an ability to mobilize their network, and they can contribute to projects. So again, a quick example, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they're connected with businesses throughout the region, uh, but they could also be universities that have uh, uh, access to research chairs and, and students, and so that, that, that all can be accessed. And, and that's really what, what's inter in interesting about the institutional role of influencer. As we work towards transition, we can convey messages through... Um, through institutions. And then the third role is linked to the, th the first two roles. They, they act as leaders and, and in, in the sense that they can, they can lead by example, they can adopt uh, best practices in terms of behaviors, they can set up initiatives that, that, that foster or promote the transition. But also institutions have an, influ an ability to bring about changes as well in a more concrete way. And maybe not as visible as we'd like to see, but, but they can act on uh, gas emissions, for example. So those are the, th the roles that institutions can play. So the sharing of expertise, influencing various stakeholders and
and their role as leaders. So we, we set up a, a, a table and we, we meet monthly. And this allows us to see how can we make progress on the transition. And I think I, could, I can probably come back to that uh, later. But maybe just to, to contrast with what Anouk has just said, um, our, our approach is maybe more top-bottom than Anouk was, was, dis, was talking about. Even though the role of citizens is important and people eventually will be called upon to, to help come up with solutions and, and action plans to, 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 uh, to carry out the transition. All right, thank you very much, Pierre-Luc. I really liked your comment about uh, the, the, the strength uh, that institutions, the, the strong role that they can play in various, at various levels. That makes me think of our next webinar, which will So here's a question for you now, Anouk. Uh, and it, now we've, we've already talked about the value of engaging in, in conversations about um, the different realities experienced by stakeholders at the local level and, and finding a point of convergence so that they can uh, come to a shared vision and accelerate to the transition. But could you talk more about how the Zen community approach relates to the work you do with communities on the ground? All right, well, t I, I think I'd like to use an example that, was, uh, that stood out, and it was an important project that stood out in our region. And people may have followed this example. There was an American company that wanted to come in our region to transform gas that would have come from Western Canada. And it would have been treated for exportation. So that project uh, ended up not happening, but would have had a great impact in the region. So a, a few years, there was a lot of social polarization that came. Uh, it was very palpable. Uh, very tangible in in the communities. There were f families and and groups that were divided on this uh, the, the this project. Now, after uh, the government tabled a report, the environmental uh, BAP decided, or the government decided not to go ahead with the project. So, so this shows that we we have to adapt to our uh, to the rallies in the past the project may have been accepted but things are changing and in the current context this project was turned down so we're talking about climate change uh, the industrial impact of, of various initiatives social inequalities that are growing uh, the economic challenges faced by uh, communities and Think of the labor shortage, for example. So we have to adapt to all of these things. So we, can, we have the power to change the narrative in our regions. We can change things. We can change how things turn out. It's not because a region has uh, traditionally developed in a certain way that we can't change things for the better now. And by creating bridges between organizations and regional uh, 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 initiatives, we can stop depending from these outside, these projects that come from outside and that we have little control over. So for example, uh, the environmental damage that uh, is caused by companies that come and then they go and they wash their hands of, of the damage that they've created. So the people in my region know each other, and we all have examples. We can all, you can all think of, of examples that people have of major layoffs in the region. 
So by working together at the regional level, we can improve things socially and environmentally. But to make those major changes, we have to make a, a, a major change. And so we need to work with other regions as well and between municipalities. And, and in our case, we have to work with other Zen communities. And then we have to work with organizations that work at the national level with, uh, through the uh, Front Commun. So there are major changes that we can't accomplish individually uh, and not just locally. So that's why the, uh, so that's why that, that's why I gave the example of the project that I, I talked about earlier. All right, thank you, Anik, uh, Anouk. Working together uh, and changing the scale of the work that we do. Uh, it, is how we'll make we'll come about we'll 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 be able to do systemic change. Now there can be tension. Uh, so my my question my next question is for Pierre Luc. In your context, in your work context, you work more with organizations and institutions in Laval, and, and each institution collaborates in different areas and has has different mandates. Now, as you engage with local partners, what are the challenges of, of collaboration? So, well, working with, uh, there, there are significant advantages to working with uh, organizations, but there are also issues related to collaboration. So the first is, is the availability of stakeholders. Uh, institutions are extremely busy so trying to get somebody to, to sit down with and to uh, establish initiatives is, is something that uh, is, is not easy. You have to be able to find time to do this. And then there's also the, the limit related to the mission of each institution. So as I was saying, each, each institution has its own mission. It has a, has a sphere of activities that it's involved in. And as I was saying, that it gives us access to a certain amount of expertise, but it, or expertise, but it also limits the actions uh, that these uh, institutions can do. So uh, sometimes an, uh, an institution won't want to go any further than its its sphere of activities, if you will. It has to stay kind of within its mandate. Another issue is. When we're dealing with institutions, now either institutions are huge, and I'll give you an example, uh, the school systems, for example. We're talking about dozens of schools often, and there are different levels. So when we deal, when we're dealing with a, with a stakeholder like that, that's very large and very diversified, we have to there's a, there's a lot of work to do ahead of time to see what's been done already with the organizations. I'll give you another example. Municipalities. Municipalities will also often have an action plan and we can't just show up and ignore the work that has been already been done by the municipalities. So, so as I said, it's important that when we're working with institutions, we've, you, you first have to identify what the institutions are already doing uh, to, to reach our objectives. And then in conclusion, one of another tension or another is that institutions often have diverse interests as well. So 
some institutions have a certain number of members that they have to answer to. And, you know, so some of them will want to participate in our steps, but uh, they don't want to uh, go against their members as well, or either. So, so I'm talking about the Laval experience, but I think that, you know, this can probably be the case. Uh, it's probably the case everywhere. So there's a diversity of interests and how can we, how far can we push our, our objectives? And institutions have different interests, different abilities to, to take action. So those are, those are some of the issues. Thank you, Pierre Luc. So it, that was a very clear description of the of the challenges uh, that you face. And I think there are similarities in Quebec and also the rest of Canada. Anouk and Pierre-Luc, thank you for sharing your, your experiences and, your, and what's happening in your communities. Carole, we have a, one last question for you. And it's about the work of uh, the Zen communities. So we've talked about the unique characteristics of these various communities and the role of the Franc, Franc commun in, in supporting that work. What, how, how, what, what can the Franc commun do to continue working and supporting this work? Thank you. That's a very important question. I'm going to have to <laughs> limit the length of my answer. Answer, but the Zen community. This this uh, collectivity Zen project is very new. It was it was launched last May, and so it's it's really an example of action research. The ultimate goal of these hubs is to change social norms in their given area, and then for there to be a snowball effect for these. Uh, uh, but, but this is something that, that doesn't happen overnight. Everything, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're still kind of in a, a co-construction model. We didn't impose a model. E everything's on the table right now and everything's being developed. Now, I was saying that each hub has a different uh, personalities and different dynamics, and I think you had we saw we saw two great uh, examples, almost extreme examples, Lac Saint Jean and Laval, and the other hubs are different as well. So that's the first one of the first avenues that that we'll have to explore: was is one of the models better than the other, or? Do we have to reinvent the wheel every time we start a new project? Another question is, is the structure. So hubs currently are, are very flexible uh, organizations, but now should they institutional become more institutional or more rigid in their structures? So that's something that we'll have to look at as well. Another possibility to explore is the, the, the processes. So is there a specific trajectory that, that all hubs could follow and that would be optimal or should be, it be different for every hub? So can we, are there lessons that can be learned from the experience of these, uh, the current hubs? And how do we act or how do we help uh, or how do how do we help when there are there's a lot of diversity in the stakeholders? So there are best practices, but what you know what can we do at that level? How can we transfer knowledge um, and and use that knowledge elsewhere? How can hubs contribute to a participatory democracy? That's really the heart of the issue. Some hubs are working with university researchers, and uh, and so we're, they're really looking uh, at that dimensions. And, and then the last thing that I'll mention that's really important is is the 
is a question of funding. We have to be able to fund uh, hubs, and that's a challenge in itself uh, because these are not small projects. I think you, I think you saw that. We have to, you have to fund the transition itself. That we have to trans, trans, or transform the, these regions if we want communities and, and territories take control of their own way of doing things and we we have to support those initiatives so how do we how do we do that so i could i could go on and on but uh i think i think i want to, i want you know we want to leave uh, room for for questions and answers as well all right thank you carol as you mentioned uh we will go to the uh, question and answer period. I wonder if there are any questions. Does anybody in the room have questions? I'm just looking at the chat. So there are two questions. Rita Jane has a question. How can we better work with municipalities? Who would like to answer that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, in terms of working with municipalities, uh, I don't think there's any miracle solution. So municipalities are institutions, but they're also political bodies as well. So and there, there are issues and, and it, it differs from one region to the next. But I think uh, another thing that's interesting is to target the right people in municipalities. And I'm not talking about, uh, you know, going to see the mayor but often when municipalities grow, they will have various departments, uh, whether it's city planning departments or, or others. But I think contacting those people is, is, a, is a really good way of, of starting. So what we ask them is how the municipality can help us. I think it's better to do that than just to show up at the city council and talk about the project. Uh, it, it allows you to, to create links and to start working within the organization itself and to, to plant a few seeds that hopefully will grow and uh, will lead to some projects. So that's what I would have to say about uh, working with the municipalities. It's, it's important to uh, identify the, the right departments or people to contact and to see what you can do with that. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Pierre-Luc. Carole? I, I would like to add something as well. I wanted to come back to the Rogers curve that Anouk showed us. <clears throat> now you can see in Quebec and elsewhere in Canada, I imagine else, everywhere, that some elected officials or, or organize, municipal organizations can be early adopters. They can be very open to things, and they could be, they might be delighted that there's a citizen movement that's in this, and then there could be others that are anywhere else on, on that curb. So, an important, an important aspect is to avoid polarization, and, and we're not saying that other people don't have don't have to deal with like the issues of resistance. But in, in terms of the Collectivity Zen project, we don't want to create opposition or we, we want to be constructive in our approach. So the, the, the idea or ideal is, is to work with elected officials that, are, uh, that buy into the project and then, and then we'll wait for the others uh, we'll wait for this, the movement to be uh, strong enough to convince the others. We, we don't want to confront them. Okay, thank you, Carol. Well, I want to maybe add to what Carol was saying. As I was explaining, we have a person beach approach, so every uh, people can can each wear a different heart. So we have uh, municipal councillors. We have. Um, provincial reps, we have citizens, 
and we have people who who ran in the in the in the latest uh, municipal election. So, so everybody is invited to come as individuals, but with their with their context. What what we what we really believe is that there there will be a change in mentalities that will happen. Uh, organically. So if a, the majority of the population feels represented in this common vision, then elected officials will, 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 will have to get involved as well. They'll, they'll, they'll jump on the train as well. So that's, that's what we're hoping for. All right. Thank you to all three of you. Let's move to the next question. Oh, there's a few questions here. <clears throat> Marlis Tohiro. What are the steps to, how, how does one become a Zen community? I, I can answer that. Well, it's a very flexible and organic process, as, as you were saying earlier. The, the first ingredient is that somebody has to carry the project or some a few people uh, or, or or an organization it's not usually individuals it's it's an it's an organization that wants to to carry the project so generally it's usually citizen groups that raise their hand and, and indicate that they want to participate But it could also be a union, local, or a school. Uh, it can be many organizations. But at one social group that's well uh, established and is very determined and they, they know what they're getting into. So it, it happens when one of these groups raised their hand and said, listen, we want to build a, a hub at such and such a scale. And it, it's interesting. It's There's never really a discussion about the scale or the the scope, uh, people usually know what they want. So, and then we worked with this, with this group to, to s we work with them. So that's how it that's how it starts. Excellent. Thank you, Carol. Next question. Question from Rita Rita Jane. Where does the funding come from? I imagine for the. I imagine she's talking about the Zen communities. I think a lot of people are familiar with the funding among the people who are participating at this meeting today. Um, it started with a one-time modest uh, funding from Caisse d'Economie Solidaire. Those, that's the organization that supported us right at the beginning. And then after that, we had uh, f uh, funding from various foundations, foundations that, are, that have a social uh, dimension and then we look towards other foundations and uh, McConnell, the McConnell Foundation, the Trotzi Family Foundation, and the Lucie and André Chagnon Foundation as well that support us. We also have uh, funding for salaries as well, but that's basically what, how our, our funding got started for now. We had to go quite far into the project before we we uh, we got serious funding, and that's normal. People don't want to invest, uh, you know, in airy fairy projects, if you will. But uh, there's are there are also volunteers or or people in in organizations who are kind of uh, loaned to us as well that that are involved. Okay, Carol, I'm sorry, did I cut you off? No, go ahead. 
Another question from Michael. And it's in the chat box. So I suppose climate action is not a hot topic for fundraising as the result of the action is not easily seen. So what are your strategies in fundraising? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, but I want to add something. I, I realize that I, I, I forgot uh, an aspect. Uh, indirect funding. So uh, university uh, academic research groups that will go get uh, funding for our projects. And that's an amazing. Uh, university of Montreal, for example, Les Chemins de Transition. I, I don't know how explicit I can be, but uh, there, uh, for Anuk's region, there are some university projects involved in that project. And, and it, it's natural. And, and then there are, are um, non-governmental organizations as well. And they don't necessarily give us money, but they give us other types of resources. So to answer more specifically to Michael's question, so the, the social econo economic transition or ecological transition is, is a priority for, for a lot of these, uh, uh, a lot of these foundations. Climate change, uh, efforts around climate change are, are harder to find funding for, in my experience. Uh, in, and there are also national organizations that are aware that, what, that we're working towards just social justice and prevention. If, if, I, can, if I can say that pre prevention of... Uh, uh, of suffering among among the most vulnerable populations that will be hit hardest by uh, climate change. So there. So our strategy, if you will, is is just to present the project like we've the projects that we've uh, you know we've been doing this morning. I I don't know if you have anything, Pierre Luc or Anouk, to add to that. Okay, excellent. All right, listen, I'm, I'm aware of the time. We have uh, a few minutes left before we uh, end. Um, I'm just going to ask the, the last question that I had. So do you have anything else to add in terms of, of strategies for climate change? And, and vulnerable groups. Well, listen, we're working very hard uh, and it's not easy to support these groups. So we're very, very busy, especially with the pandemic. So it's not easy. Uh, we've created positions and this is very recent as well. We've uh, the, we haven't been, we haven't had significant funding for, for a long time, so, but our vision is, 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 is to work towards our goal and we want to, we want to keep building on what we're doing to make project, uh, make progress. Well, in our, in my region, uh, we have a project called Entendre Toutes les Voix, or Hearing All the Voices, uh, and it doesn't necessarily address vulnerability to climate change, but our aim is to reach organizations that are already working with vulnerable populations that, uh, that, that are providing services to them, So we're trying to meet with these people when they're available to, to explain our project to them. Uh, and sometimes we, are, we often take 
training to 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 learn how to kind of approach these these people who uh, come from diverse by backgrounds. And we can also join activities that have already taken place, so uh, meetings or general assemblies, or share some pizza with uh, with at, at events that people are already gathering. And present our projects in in a in a place where people feel comfortable already, and with the hopes that this will be a positive experience for them. We we don't want to come. We don't want to show up kind of talking about problems. What the problems are? We want to talk about. We want to talk or them to talk about what their aspirations and their dreams are. So that's uh, we we want to hear everybody's voice. Excellent. All right, Pierre Luc. I just I just want to add something. Uh, there was another question that was uh, asked in the chat. So it was about how how do we make sure that these actions uh, become long lasting? And I think there are different ways to approach it. It's about involving stakeholders, regardless the level that they're at, not just approaching, not, not just approaching people passively, but getting them involved, saying, listen, we have something to, we have something to do. What do you want to do to get involved? Whether it's an institution or a citizen group, that's a really important aspect, I think. If you want something to, la to last long, we have to, people have to kind of take responsibility for the uh, activities. All right, thank you. Thank you all to all three of you. I'm aware of the time, so I want to thank you for your reflection and your, your thoughts today. Thank you to the members, the community members who participated in this uh, webinar. We will be uh, we will be sending a follow-up email with the webinar takeaways and a link to the recording. My colleagues have already put uh, links to articles and webinars uh, of, of the, the links, the events that are coming. And uh, if you have, if anybody, if you have questions or comments or reactions to this webinar, feel free to contact me. I'm at Jorge at tamarackcommunity.ca. And we'll, we will be uh, sending uh, the, we will be putting the emails in the chat. So thank you for uh, participating in this learning activity. We have a great day and we'll see you next time.